Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to The Nest. It's July 2nd, 2020, and we're streaming live with participants from Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America. For those of you joining for the first time, I'm Jim Chu in San Francisco, and the goal here on The Nest is to connect entrepreneurs of frontier markets with angel investors worldwide. We stream live every Thursday, and all episodes are recorded and available on our website, findthenest.org. Today, we are co-hosting The Nest with the Living Labs Federation, an initiative from Jan Lemoel, focused on sustainable innovation and impacts. We'll hear a bit more from Jan in a second, and we'll also hear pitches from two startups vetted by Jan and The Nest team. We also welcome three new angels to The Nest, Haresh, Greg, and Nathan, all based in Asia. We'll hear about all of that in a second, but before, we'll start with a few important announcements. Next week on July 9th, we will have a session in partnership with the Opportunity Collaboration with a guest moderator, Jorian Wilkins. Join us at our usual time, 9 a.m. San Francisco time, 5 p.m. London time, and 7 p.m. Nairobi time. On July 16th, we will host a joint session in partnership with the Bangladesh Angels. And the week after that, on July 23rd, we'll have a session with all female entrepreneurs. I hope you can join us for all of those sessions. And with that, let's launch our poll. Where is everyone from? Let's cover some technical tips for today. For those of you in the audience, we want to hear from you. This is an interactive forum and we left it open on purpose for questions and comments from everyone and anyone. So use that chat box, talk to others watching the show, make comments and ask your questions. In the meantime, use that box to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you do, which country you're from and why you're here on the show. And please don't forget to use that mute button if you're not speaking. That's it, let's get going. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jim Chu and I'm based here in San Francisco, California, where it's 4 a.m. I'd like to add for all of you to note. I invest in startups and developed and frontier markets, both personally and through Untapped. Our mission at Untapped is to drive investment to support entrepreneurs in frontier markets. So if you're interested in frontier markets, let me know. I'm at jim at untappedinc.com and you can also find me on LinkedIn. Over to Jan Lemuel, who helped us choose the companies for this show. Jan? Thank you, Jim. And thanks for the offer. Uh, so the Living Labs Federation is uh, um, the decision I made to uh, take a chance in my life. I'm a corporate beast, as a friend of mine just quoted me, for 20 years. And uh, uh, I wanted to do things differently regarding sustainability and uh, go at the base of the pyramid. And I found a lot of local initiatives that are great, a lot of people trying to save the world. But uh, as they're small, they struggle to meet. And most of the time, they're not in in the same networks that uh, never collide, I would say. And through my weird life, I happen to have the chance to have crossed those networks and I'm able to connect people from all over in the world uh, that have the same vision. And um, I wanted to create a, um, a system where actually this goes global, uh, not only me. And uh, so that's the living lab. And the goal is uh, the way we do this, uh, we want to create the business of tomorrow. By the way, the mic's on. You turn it back on. Why is this? And the way, the way. Sorry, I, I have a That's feedback. Right. Uh, uh, so the way to do it to do this actually is twofold. First, it's a methodology for impact investing. Uh, rather than starting from the innovation, uh, we start from uh, the people on the field trying to solve uh, problems. Being in the rainforest, being in the oceans, we study what they try to accomplish, and then we source innovation that can uh, uh, help them. Uh, we build acceleration programs. And then we are able to uh, find impact investors that can uh, uh, support those programs. Uh, and uh, that's the methodology. And the ecosystem is basically to, uh, to build a platform where all those people can collide. We can bring expertise. We can bring access to investors from all around the world. And as you'll see to, in a few minutes uh, with Mubarak and Fariel, uh, from a need we tried to help solving in the in the deep rainforest in Brazil, uh, 
I met Jim, an impact investor uh, from America that's going to listen to uh, a person based in Ghana, another one based in Pakistan, and I'm myself in Singapore. And that typically illustrates what you try to accomplish with the Living Labs. It's a real global system. Exactly. Great. Well, thank you for connecting all of us. Well, great. Uh, I, now over to some of the angels. Haresh, would you like to kick it off? Hi, everyone. My name is Harish Aswani. Uh, basically, I'm the managing director for Toleram Group for the African business. Uh, very passionate about developing more businesses in Africa. I think there's a lot of uh, potential. And during this COVID period, what has been interesting is that uh, I have had the opportunity through people like Jim and Raj and all to interact with startup entrepreneurs. And I believe there's still uh, a lot of scope and a lot of uh, potentials to, to develop more business in there. So I'm quite excited to hear our two people who are coming on board today. I've read a bit about them and quite exciting business proposals. So thank you. Great. And, and I, I understand you've done quite a bit of <clears throat> angel investing as well, uh, especially recently. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And uh, we're going to do a bit more. <laughs> and, and are there certain regions in the world that uh, are the most interesting to you? No, I'm still focusing on Africa, except I'm putting some criteria. And one of the criteria I'm doing, Jim, is that the women must be involved in the projects. Mm, fabulous. Fabulous. Well, great. Thank you very much for being on the show. Greg? <clears throat> yeah, hi, Jim. Thank you. Uh, my name is Greg Blackwood. I'm based in Singapore. I'm the uh, co-founder of Genuine Interest which is an AI-driven uh, quant fund. And we have, uh, I, I don't think it's a unique model anymore, but uh, it certainly is a model that I haven't seen often. Uh, we use liquid markets, mostly US markets, to generate returns via a quant al algorithm. Uh, not, uh, not tick trading, but uh, what, not even day trading, what I like to call two week trading. Uh, and uh, anything over and above 10%, a baseline 10%, now uh, we earmark for impact causes. So some of those could be charitable donations. Uh, more and more we are blending loans, low interest rate loans in developing countries uh, to businesses that uh, typically uh, are run by a social entrepreneur or as uh, Haresh just mentioned, are somehow asset backed uh, and do create impact via that route. Fabulous, and so, um... Is the platform open to any investors? Anybody could be investor in genuine interest? So the platform is open to investors who self-declare as accredited investors. And there is, of course, a know your customer check that needs to be conducted by one of the three uh, co-founders, myself or my two partners. Uh, other, other than that, we're fairly open, yes, as long as people believe in the mission. Um, we, are, uh, we are definitely open to, uh, to, to taking anyone that... Uh, that would like to help improve our little corner of the world here. Great. Well, just to give you a plug, if you want to put in your chat box uh, the URL and so folks can check it out, I think uh, there might be some folks that are interested. Great. Thank you, Jim. Over to you, Nathan. Uh, thanks, Jim, for having me on. Um, I'm based out of Sri Lanka. Um, we, we have a family office uh, based out of Singapore that invests in various types of businesses. Um, and secondly, the passion is... Um, been entrepreneurship and uh, we have the largest co-working space accelerator and incubator in Sri Lanka. Um, we're just opening in Pakistan and Bangladesh as well. Mm. Uh, and this space um, uh, really encourages entrepreneurs to uh, thrive in South Asia mainly. Um, we do a lot of investment, um, seed and series A investments um, based on that. And also uh, through my Kaufman Fellow Network, um, we are also um, investing in um, other funds as well. I'm, I'm very unfamiliar with the uh, Sri Lankan uh, angel market, or I'm sorry, the startup market. What kind of companies are, are the most prominent in Sri Lanka, would you say? Um, a, a lot of them are around AI at this moment, uh, but uh, also food technology seems to be uh, coming up quite a bit because um, Sri Lanka is pretty famous for some of the raw materials of things like tea. Um, cinnamon, uh, which is globally known as so food tech, is uh, becoming a, a leader in, in this part of the world. Mm, interesting. 
And in Pakistan and uh, uh, Bangladesh, it's a lot of fintech and uh, pharmaceutical organizations that, that are developing interesting technology around that. Right. Well, hopefully one of these days we'll have some of those uh, promising companies on the nest as well. Love to. All right. Well, great. Let's get started. It looks like we have the results of the poll as well. Should we put that up? Okay, while we're waiting for that. Uh, oh, it looks like we do have them here. So it looks like we have a pretty broad distribution uh, with a lot of representation from Asia. Thank you. Um, that makes the 4 a.m. wake up time a little bit easier. And um, we have quite a few from Africa and also Europe and North America. Well, everybody welcome on the show from around the world. All right, now over to the presenters. Um, yes, Diana Murak and Fariel, they're all here. And just before we get started, let me go over some of the rules. Each of you will have five minutes, that's five minutes to present, and another 15 to 20 minutes for questions and hopefully some discussion on a deal. Uh, we will cut you off at five minutes, so please help us respect the time so we can have a good discussion. All right, so first up, we have Diana and Muvarak from Bezo Money, and they will tell us all about digital savings for the unbanked. Go ahead, and I'm gonna unshare my screen, and over to you. So my name is uh, Mubarak. I'm the CEO of Bezo Money, and I'm here with um, Diana, and we're here to present uh, a digital savings and lending um, solution that we've built for people in the informal sector. So I'm gonna allow Diana to start with the presentation. So Jim, I think the time. Yes. All right. Greetings from Visa Money, where we empower people to create wealth through savings. Our vision is to empower people to create wealth through savings. Our vision is to become Africa's largest community based digital bank. Globally, 2 billion people are unbanked, pushing families into poverty and making them unable to manage financial emergencies. Although fintech can help to financially include them, it must align with their behaviors and needs. A very typical behavior among the unbanked is group savings. Saving in groups has been practiced for centuries and remains very popular in many developing countries, offering social support and community building. A group makes contributions and gives the bulk sum to a different person at the end of every week or they keep the money in a common fund used to provide small loans to members. Members pay fees, usually 10% of withdrawal amounts to their group leaders who secure the money. Members also save individually with SUSU collectors, traditional financial intermediaries who collect their daily savings for 30 days and charge a 3% monthly fee. For many women, this is their only way of accessing finance and realizing their dreams. But these savings schemes are not without problems. They save in boxes and their mattresses and with SUSU collectors and have paper-based records, subjecting their money to theft, mismanagement, and loss in value. Also, their savings amounts do not satisfy their growing demand for credit, and being unable to build a savings and credit history excludes them from the former financial system. 413 million people in Africa save $301 billion in group every year, and they are in dire need of a solution to address their problem and gain upward social mobility. Bezo Money provides a digital savings and lending platform to the unbanked, allowing them to create an online record history to access credit while preserving their group activities and bond. We offer Bezo Susu to help them save by setting savings goals as individuals or as groups through mobile money, Bezo credits for them to access interest-free loans with an application fee to pay for school fees and buy inventory, and Bezo pay to pay for products and services from our partners. Our entry market, Ghana, is the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa and presents a unique opportunity for us to leverage mobile money. We target 26 million people in the informal sector, such as traders, micro merchants, and farmers. An individual saves on average $45 a month and a group $192. In our first year, we charge 0.5 to 1% fee on their savings goals and share interest with them. With a fintech license in year two, we'll be able to offer our users zero fees and higher interest rates. We also make one to 3% on loans and earn commissions from third party financial service providers. 
We signed NDAs with Vodafone, Visa, and AFSA to explore key partnerships and an MOU with Grameen. Grameen Foundation and Vodafone will give us access to 12,000 farmers and 3 million subscribers. We also have 450 people um, signed up to our platform to test and give us feedback. In the next three years, we'll conduct proof of concept tests with these partners, acquire the FinTech license to be able to help our users manage their financial assets, launch our credit products in the WhatsApp bots for millennials, and scale across Ghana with other major mobile money operators, projecting a revenue of $14 million in our third year. We started with a seed fund, a pre-seed of 100,000 US dollars from MES, and that was in August 2019. And with a seed fund of $250,000, we'll be able to apply the FinTech license. And and successfully launch our product and scale across Ghana. Um, locally, our competitors are microfinance institutions and SUSU collectors. Their paper-based records and insufficient credit scoring system drives huge inefficiencies and increased costs for their operations. But we are relatively cheaper and we have a user-friendly USSD interface and mobile money with credit scoring integration, which allows us to cost-effectively service our users and differentiates us from players in other markets. Our team has 16 years experience in software and business development. Mubarak is the CEO, our in-house software developer, Kenneth, is the CTO, and I, Diana, am the CMO. We've all stayed, worked, and built products for people focused at the base of the pyramid. Our advisors work in banks, telcos, and nonprofits, and provide us with insights, recommendations, and entry into the financial services space. We are big of money. Save up, grow together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Great presentation and right on time as well. All right, over to the angels for comments and questions. Hi, Jim. Uh, do you mind if I start off? Please, go for it. Uh, Diana uh, Mubarak, thank you very much. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about digital competition? Because if, uh, if so much of the country is moving to digital money, there must obviously be digital players who uh, may be directly competitive or they may be in adjacent spaces and could very quickly become competitive if they chose to do so. Yes. Um, so um, as we mentioned on the entry market slide, uh, Ghana has the fastest uh, growing mobile money markets in Africa. And this uh, was solely uh, contributed to by uh, MTN uh, uh, Mobile Money. So they launched a service that is very similar to uh, MPESA way back in two, uh, 2010, and they've been able to, to grow the, uh, the digital uh, money transfer space over the last um, 10 years. And so, um, so far, it's the, uh, it's the telcos that have been uh, in, in, in this space. And so, uh, but we haven't had a whole lot of startups uh, trying to enter into the space. So when it comes to direct competition, uh, we do not have any from any of um, indirect competition from, from the telcos. Uh, but then the good news is that the, the telcos usually do not build, uh, build their own uh, product on top of the mobile money infrastructure. They would rather partner with the fintech companies to do so. And so that is what we have seen uh, historically over the past few, uh, few, few years. So um, what they do mostly is to help people transfer money from one point to another. But then when they want to launch a savings product or let's say a, a, a lending product, they, they would rather partner with the uh, a fintech company to, to be able to, to actually do so. And uh, that's why they're actually uh, interested in working with us. And that's how come we have the NDA signed with um, Vodafone. Yes. Gotcha. Great. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, if I can ask Jim a few questions. Um, Please go ahead. A couple of questions uh, around, number one, um, I'm quite familiar with the trust uh, network um, with a company in Indonesia that did very well. Um, it was called uh, Ruma and then Mapan. It sold over to uh, Gojack uh, a couple of years ago for a pretty nice sum. So this trust circle really works around the world. Um, my question is a couple of things. One is, what, what's the plan to onboard more cohorts and uh, how, how do you ensure that you're onboarding the right types of cohorts? Um, I know you've 
chosen three areas, but um, what is the plan in terms of uh, onboarding the cohort um, in each of the villages? All right, so uh, we have three main strategies uh, when it comes to uh, onboarding uh, new people to join uh, our, our platform. Uh, the first thing is that we use uh, market associations. So uh, you would find that uh, these uh, informal sector workers are normally uh, centralized marketplaces because they, they mostly do, uh, do uh, buying and selling activities. And so we go through the market uh, associations to onboard a, 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 a whole lot of them. And so, so far we have 450 people and we're able to onboard about 150 from just one event we did at uh, one marketplace. And then the other strategy is to work with development uh, agencies like uh, Care in, uh, uh, International Grammy Foundation. So, so these are people that, that normally work with the savings groups. And there are also some development uh, agencies that, uh, that basically go around creating savings groups, helping people in the, in the villages be able to bank themselves. And so we are, we are actually going through them to, be, uh, to also be able to onboard uh, a whole lot of people. So, so far, the MOU we've signed with the uh, Grameen Foundation has given us access to 12,000 of them. And then uh, the, the last strategy is to go to uh, go through the, uh, the mobile money operators. And so currently, Vodafone has about 3 uh, million people that are subscribed uh, to their mobile money service. And so based on the partnership that we would have with them, uh, Bezo Money is going to be listed in their, in their mobile money interface. Therefore, each of uh, those people that use uh, the, uh, the Vodafone cash system would, would be able to see uh, Bezo Money when they dial their uh, short code to transfer money. And so through that, we'll, be also, we'll also be able to onboard a whole lot of people. But I think our main strategy is uh, we be, being able to use uh, the market uh, associations and also going through the development agencies. And, and with your lending um, platform going to be two years from now, um, how, how do you compare to, uh, say, the microfinance institutes? Um, wouldn't they have an advantage over you? Okay. Right. So um, um, the standard uh, interest rates in the industry right now is actually four to um, six point nine nine percent. So that is what the microfinance uh, industry is charging uh, these uh, lending circles and informal sector workers. And so we are offering uh, it's not even an interest, it's an application fee. So for, for the microfinance, they charge an application fee and then the interest. But then we are charging just one to three uh, percent of the amount that a person wants to rent from them. The other thing is that, okay, uh, time, okay. <laughs> so the, the other thing is that uh, uh, most of their operations are paper based, and so they are not even able to properly credit score uh, their customers, and they, they mostly uh, uh, basically rely on uh, group pressure to get the groups to uh, pay back the loans that have been taken. But then we are we are using tech. We also have an inbuilt credit scoring system that automatically credit scores people that save with the platform. So that's how we're, we're making ourselves different from them. And also in Ghana, the microfinance industry has been hit uh, very hardly by the, by the Bank of Ghana based on how they've been uh, managing savings groups and people in the informal sector. They give them loans at high, high uh, interest rates and they, uh, they can't even get back to, uh, those loans. So just last year, we had about 500 mi microfinance companies being closed down by, by the Bank of Ghana. So this is kind of open up the, opening up the market for, for us to come in with a tech solution to solve the problem. Right. I, lost, I lost a bit of the presentation, Mubarak. I'm sorry about that. But I just want to okay. be, be a little bit uh, sure about how does this group savings work? I didn't get quite clear. I, I know you may have answered it, but I missed yes. that part of the presentation. Okay. And so I'm going to go to that slide. And so what, what happens is that mostly you have uh, about 12 people who meet every week or every month to, uh, to put together a specific amount of money. So each person, for instance, could bring uh, $4 at the end of that week or at the end of that, that month. And then they, they put together that money and give it to one person within the group. And so they do that until each person, each of, of the 12 people gets um, that land, a, 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 a sum. And then the other thing is, or the other model is they save the money each month and then keep the money inside the uh, inside a box. And so they, they keep doing that on, until somewhere around the third month. And so when they get to, to, the, to the third month, uh, a, a, certain a, a certain number of people are able to take a loan from, uh, from the group's box and then pay back with interest. And so they, they keep doing that until each person takes a loan and pays back. At the end of the year, they sit down and then, uh, and then they, they disperse the entire sum in the box to the people that have been saving in the box. So this is based on the, the amount of money you save uh, throughout the, uh, the, uh, the year. And so, and the other thing is they also save with the social collectors who are, uh, 
uh, individuals that come to them to take money daily. So, so that is for their, their own uh, individual savings. With, with the group savings, they pay a, a fees of 10% to their group leaders. With the SUSU collectors, they pay fees of 3% per month to the SUSU collectors. And so the fees are very high. Uh, the, the system is highly inefficient. It's, it's paper-based. They've been doing it for a very long time. It works for them. But then we are, we are coming in to make it better and also to give them an interest on, 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 on their savings, helping them to build uh, that, that savings and credit history that could give them access to the former financial system. And do you plan to roll that saving capital, for example, maybe put it into fixed deposit to earn some interest? Exactly, yes, yes. And so um, on our uh, uh, revenue slide, in, in the first, this and then this, you would see that in the first uh, year and then in the second year, uh, the interest that uh, we'll be getting or the money that we're making wouldn't be too much. But in the third and fourth year, we're assuming that based on the money we are able to raise, we'll be able to get a fintech license. And then based on that, we can put the user savings into fixed deposits. We can't even lend money back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the people that are, that are saving with us. Okay, I have a plan to know. So Murak, I have a question about um, the data. I'm very curious to hear okay. how you're doing the uh, database credit checks and what okay. else you're planning to do with the data. Because you're collecting okay. a tremendous amount of information about consumers, which is great. Yes. Um, and so um, what we're doing right now is that we're using, we're, uh, we're taking um, the savings history plus uh, psychometric tests to credit score them. And so these are the, uh, the, uh, the two main things that we are, we are we're actually using for, uh, for the credit scoring. Um, aside that, we, I mean, we, we, we haven't really put in place a plan to maybe uh, give someone access to, to the data that we have. But what, what we can clearly see is that we can partner with the uh, financial institutions who have money and who want to lend this money to the users that we have. Gotcha. Uh, in terms of, uh, so the, uh, did you, when you factor in a low interest rate, I mean, the mo main reason that, uh, um, uh, you know, microfinance uh, has a slightly more higher interest is the non-performing loans. So did you? and a lower interest rate, what that non-performing loan uh, would look like and what that uh, would do to your model? Yes. And so um, uh, the, uh, the main reason why they have high interest rates is, is because of their high rates of a uh, high cost of uh, operation. And the main reason why they have high cost of uh, operation is because their system is, is highly paper-based and is, is based on agents that they send on ground to go and take money from, uh, from these people. And so we are, we are doing away with all of that and then bringing in tech. So, you know, so, so based on that, they, they spend so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so much money trying to service uh, 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 the, uh, the informal sector people. And then that feeds into the amount of money that, uh, that they charge them for the loans that, that, that they give. So based on the fact that we are removing all of that, we're not even uh, using any agents. Uh, what, what we're currently doing is that if you are a business money user and then wants to save on our platform, all, all you have to do is to sign up with, uh, with, your, with your mobile money uh, accounts and then uh, create a savings goal on the Bezo money system. And in order to make deposits, you go, you put the money into your into your mobile money wallet, and then we will take it out based on the savings goal. And so we uh, keep doing that until you hit your savings goal, and then maybe you want to take back the the money. You can also do so. And so and so we are we are basically cutting out all of um, um, the paper based stuff that occurs in the micro uh, finance industry and also the agents. Because that's that's actually where a, a huge chunk of their of their money is go. Would you say that uh, um, uh, Vodafone would be a competitor to you in the long term? Um, in the long term, I would say no. So over the uh, past ten years, uh, that a, uh, that a, uh, that a mobile money. Is... Hmm. There's some connection issues over there with Mubarak. Uh, feel free to jump in, Diana, if you want to add to what he's saying. Comes back. Well, I just wanted to add that uh, another reason why there may be non-performing loans uh, for our traditional competitors, the microfinance institutions, because of their paper-based records and the way the credit score their clients. So they're not able to tell who is credit worthy. They rely on this group pressure from uh, the group loans that they give to be able to recoup their loans. So because they are not able to credit score them well, they make the loans high. 
the interest rates on the loans high. So if one group is not able to pay successfully, they are still able to get their money back. Uh, we have incorporated better credit scoring mechanisms in our platform to allow us to reduce the cost of servicing our, our clients and we also reduce non-performing loans because we don't have an interest rate, we just have application fee on the loan. Yeah, so that's it's interesting. Conventional yeah. microfinance uh, has very high administrative costs and, and also very high default rates in reality. Yeah. So I think um, using data to really reduce your default rates and make your and, and using digital money to make um, your your administrative costs lower is a very smart move. There was a question from Raj Kulasingham in the audience about um, the more about the WhatsApp bot. Can you talk about more about what the WhatsApp what? bot? Okay, um, I, I just switched my, my, my internet, so I hope it's, it's okay now. <laughs> yeah, right, so I'd like to, to touch on the, on the Vodafone questioning and talk, talk about the bot. Oh, please. Yeah, exactly, and so in the past uh, uh, 10 years, uh, the telcos that have been running the, uh, the, uh, the mobile money platforms, they have been partnering with fintech companies to uh, deploy products on their system. So they would rather do that than build the thing themselves and manage it. So what they do is they partner with you uh, put it on, on their infrastructure and then charge you a fee. So we factored that fee in our cost of uh, operation. Uh, so it, it's actually in our, in our uh, COGS. And so, um, and so what, th that's what they have been doing. And based on the agreements that we signed with Vodafone, we, we made sure that they, they basically were not going to copy whatever we had. And to them, it actually makes more sense for them to work with us to, to deploy it than they doing the thing all by themselves. And uh, the question about the WhatsApp bots, and so um, we've seen that there's a lot of interest from young people and also from, uh, from uh, students, uh, uh, people that just started working. They are very interested in saving with um, basal money. And uh, I think they like the fact that we're, we're forward thinking, we're, we're trying to digitize things, trying to do things differently from how people have currently been doing things. And so you find people even, even in their offices doing this group savings. And so the group savings is not actually something that is limited to the informal sector. There are people that within their offices uh, put together money at, at the end of every month and, and give it to one person. Maybe the person wants to buy a car or a house, they're able to actually make down payments for, for that. And so there's a lot of interest amongst young people to, to save with that. And so we thought um, in, a, in a few years time, it would actually make sense to build something for that uh, target uh, base. And so in order to go in that direction, we decided to, to look at WhatsApp and then build uh, the savings platform on top of WhatsApp. And I mean, we are all also uh, very familiar with, uh, with the user base of, of, of uh, WhatsApp in Africa, which is you know, um, go, going to basically help us be able to target a whole, a whole lot of uh, these uh, young uh, people. Great, yeah. Yes. To add to that, we're collaborating with Visa um, to be able to develop this WhatsApp app. Gotcha. Raj is also asking, what's the ask? Okay. <laughs> right. So the ask is 250K. Um, the reason why we're asking for this amount is because we want to be able to secure the license so that we can ramp up uh, the, uh, the revenue. So you can see it from here. So once we have the license, we'll be able to manage um, the deposits of the customers. We can give it to, um, we can give the deposit to uh, fund managers to, to basically put their money into fixed deposits. And by, by so doing, we can earn a higher interest rate on the deposits. And then we can also lend uh, some, some of the money back to uh, the people with, as we said, the one to, uh, to, uh, to, to three percent application fee. And so that's our main focus. Our main focus is to be able to secure that FinTech license. And uh, we'd also need uh, 90K to basically uh, continue with our product uh, marketing and then business development. So also from Raj, what happens if you can't get a fintech license? What's yeah, so if we can, for? yes, if we can get a license, there's actually, uh, there's, there's a low, um, so there are, I think, six tiers when it comes to the fintech license. There's one that has no minimum capital, but then when we, when we work with that layer, then we, we have to give the money to uh, an existing financial institution to manage it for us. And in that case, we can't, we 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 cannot um, be able to invest the deposits. And so, what would happen is uh, we've actually spoken to one of them, um, aside APSA. It, it's uh, it's called a Bayport uh, Financial Services. 
So we, we had a, a discussion with them and they informed us that they could give us an interest of 26% uh, per annum. And so that in, in the absence of the FinTech license, we would have to be making that uh, on the deposits of, of the user. So they would invest it obviously and then take a cut and then give us that. But if we get a license, we get to manage the, uh, the money ourselves. Gotcha. It, question um, for is it is it only in uh, the revenue you're showing in 23-24? Is that just from Ghana or is it um, growing outside of Ghana as well? Yeah, so this is just uh, from Ghana. So what we did was to use um, the figure that we got from Vodafone and also uh, from Grameen and also from our own efforts to basically project the, the number of people that we uh, will be able to onboard o over the next three to four years. So this is just Ghana. I have a couple of questions. Uh, what I, okay. One is, are you yeah. putting a cap uh, as to how much you will lend in future? And also, if you can tell us a little bit about what your consumers are saving for today. Okay. okay. Um, when, when you say a, a cap, um, can, you, can you sort of uh, uh, elaborate on that? So, you know, if you have a, a thousand clients, so to speak, is there a cap of $100 or $200 or $1,000? Mm -hmm. What is your cap per, per consumer? Okay, is it um, in terms of what we make from them or what they save? What they save. What they save, okay. So um, on average, we have uh, each person saving $1.5 uh, dollars now, which is about seven Ghana cities a day. And so in, in 30 days, they have something around $45. And so we are assume that in the third and fourth year, that money would increase to uh, to. Uh, $2 based on the fact that they've been saving with Bezo money and have invested the money back in, into their businesses. So their average savings per month would increase to uh, $60. And then for the group, each group saves, uh, each person in a group saves on average $4 in a week. And then in a month, that person saves um, uh, $16. And so that happens for the 12 people uh, within the group. And uh, we are also assuming that in the third and fourth year, uh, the, uh, the average savings per person in a group would increase to $6. So that's what we use uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the projections. Now, uh, concerning the, what they normally save for, uh, they, they mostly save up the money so they can invest it in, into their businesses and also be able to pay for school fees. So the, the follow-up question is, will there be a cap on your lending limit to per client? Yes. So in the in the um, the lending uh, uh, products would uh, would be launched in uh, 2022, and so what what would happen there is that for starters we will be lending uh, on average hundred dollars to one person. That's for for the first year of launching the the uh, lending product, and then in the second year of launching the lending product, that amount would increase to 150. Now that amount would increase for the people that are able to develop a, a very good uh, credit score in the first year. For the group, it will increase from 200 in the first year to 300 in, in the second year. Right. Sorry, uh, Jim, I have one more if I may. Yes, okay. please. Uh, so over the first, uh, if, presuming you get the money, over the, over the first 12 months, you're looking at scaling uh, by, by 100x, right? So two orders of magnitude. Um, <clears throat> just because you have access to those networks doesn't necessarily mean that those people will adopt your solution. There's uh, onboarding educational curves and there's also just a flat out customer acquisition cost. Can yes, you speak yes. a little bit to that over the first 12 months and, uh, and describe to us how that impacts your business, please? Yeah, and so um, for the Grameen, we assume, I mean, as you've said, we assume that we'll not be able to onboard everybody and so we assumed that we'll be able to onboard 60% of the, of the 12,000. For Vodafone, we assume we'll be able to onboard only 30%. And so that's what we use for the, uh, the revenue projection. Now, this is like worst case, like, like if nothing at all happens, and, 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 and as, uh, 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 as you said, like all of these things come in, we're assuming that we'll be able to get just 30%. But if everything goes very well, that we might be able to onboard maybe up to 50%. Now, th these are 3 million people uh, from uh, Vodafone. Uh, oh, okay, I, I understand that. Um, what are the costs involved in onboarding those people? Yes, so for uh, in onboarding one person, we spend uh, uh, 0 0.4 to onboard just one person. That's uh, $0.4 to onboard one customer. 
And uh, the reason why it's so low is because we target the groups. So if we are able to talk, if, when we talk to one group, a, a group on average has 12 people. And so just by engaging with one group, we're able to get uh, potentially 12 people uh, uh, signing up with uh, Bezo Money. Have you seen um, on the, you know, you said that people are saving up for schools or um, for the, their business. So ha have you seen an opportunity of um, supply chain uh, where you can potentially use, um, understand what they're saving for and have a supply chain supporting that as well? Yes, yes. And so uh, that's why we actually have Bezo Pay from, uh, from the slide. And so we, we asked ourselves that, okay, so these people are saving uh, basically with themselves. Uh, they are lending uh, uh, this money to themselves. How can we, and at the end of the day, they use the money for something, which is why they're actually saving it. And so we asked ourselves, how can we come in at the point of they spending uh, um, that money? And so we spoke to some uh, supermarkets in Ghana. Uh, there's one called Melcom. You might know about them if you've been to Ghana. And so what we basically discussed with them was that is there a way they can supply the women with what they, they want? So essentially, we channel their savings directly from the, uh, the women's wallets or the wallets of the group to, to them. So that's where, and also we think we can also make some, some money from the, uh, from the discounts that will be offered by um, those uh, supply chains. Or, uh, like uh, the, uh, the supply uh, uh, customers. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mubarak. Uh, just over to the angels now on discussion on uh, what kind of interest you have. Angels? I don't think I'm ready to invest, but I'd like to learn more. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I would definitely invest. But as uh, Nathan says, there are still a few questions to ask you and also to understand your valuation proposal, right? Okay. Fabulous. That's great. It's great to hear. I would uh, agree with Harish. Uh, I think there's opportunity. Um, I know this model pretty well, um, and I think you can scale it pretty fast uh, with the learnings that we've had uh, so far in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Fabulous. Great. Well, congratulations, Diana Mubarak. Uh, two, two interests. Uh, we will connect uh, Harish and Nathan, and also Greg, of course, with, with you. Um, and Diana, and uh, let's, let's, let's have a further conversation about putting a syndicate together. Great. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's, uh, let's move on to the uh, next one. Oh, actually, before we move on, we have a little bit of a poll that you probably just saw that came on. Um, maybe we can post the results of the poll over right there. So we have a little bit across the board, uh, a lot of folks in the middle. Uh, indicating that there's some interests to invest um, around $10,000 um, and up to $25,000. So congratulations. It's, uh, I, I've, I've always uh, thought that group savings such as this, uh, such as are popular all around the world, have tremendous potential for, for digitizing. So I'm glad to see somebody doing that. And uh, I think uh, I might be interested as well to join Haresh and Nathan. Um, and, and potentially Greg in that in that round. Yes. Thanks, Murad. All right, thank you. Jim. All right, fabulous. Uh, Farayal, over to you. Hi, so that was uh, that was intense. Um, so should I share my screen now? Yes, and, please share uh, your screen. Okay. Hi, my name is Faryal Salahuddin and I am the CEO and founder of Uptrade. Uptrade works with 1.2 billion farmers to enable them to use their livestock as currency. Meet Imam Karo. Imam Karo uh, is a smallholder livestock far farmer. Him and his family live in a remote off-grid village in Tharparkar in Pakistan. Every day, Imam Karo's wife and his daughter walk up to four hours a day to collect water for their family and their animals. At earning $70 a month doesn't allow them to be able to afford a solar water pump, which would change their lives. They earn their income by selling their animals um, in the local marketplace. 
The marketplace, however, is two hours from their village and they rely on the local middlemen to get their animals to market. The middlemen most of the time pays them a fraction of the cost of the goat and pays them over many weeks. At the other end of the value chain are large meat companies. And these meat companies face the challenge of getting a vetted, healthy supply of animals. Our model, Goats for Water, solves for both these pr pr problems, where families and communities like Imam Karo's collect 15 to 17 goats, which they give to Uptrade. And Uptrade, working with its partners, then installs a solar water pump selling the animals to the meat companies, recovering the cost of the pump and making a profit on top of that. Since 2017, we have now installed solar water pumps and we have introduced solar home systems. This year, we are going to be introducing solar smart phones and micro drip irrigation systems. In August of last year, we, we introduced an electronic marketplace where farmers like Imam Karo could use our digital plat platform and sell directly to the meat companies, uh, thereby bypassing the layers of intermediaries and middlemen, which make the value chain super inefficient. We have seen this problem arise for smallholder livestock farmers in many other frontier countries, where we hope to go and share this model. There are 1.2 billion smallholder livestock farmers that we are hoping to impact, while tapping into the $1.3 trillion meat industry. Through our work, we, we bring around change in six SDGs. By pro pro providing clean energy and water, we, we remove the time poverty, increase the productivity, and incentivize smallholder farmers to, be, to remain central to the meat value chain. We have already impacted 7,000 farmers in Pakistan. And this year, through our partnership with the largest microfinance bank, we hope to, to open up 10 more locations and access 70,000 farmers. We are already in the process of, of moving our company to the Netherlands, where we will become part of the vibrant ag tech community. We are also launching an organic meat line, which will enable us to sell at higher margins. We have achieved all of this through $140,000 that have been raised as grant and awards. We are looking to raise $400,000 for, for, for growth, but, but with 150,000, we can reach sustainability by opening up three more centers, focusing on the marketing and increasing the price that we sell at. We also want to bring our tech team in-house. We are extremely close to breaking even. Currently, we are selling 200 animals a month at $6.3 a kg. With three centers, we are able to to procure 600 animals and at $7.8 we break even by selling 300 animals. This has all been achieved by our amazing team where Lisa and I bring our international experience and entrepreneurial experience and our Pakistan team brings their in-depth country knowledge and expertise. I would like to leave this slide as the last slide here to show you the scale uh, of the impact that we can bring around the globe to realize our vision of impacting 1.2 billion farmers globally. And this is our ask. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rariel, and uh, great presentation and great traction. I love it. Over to the angels. Um, Fariel, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, good to meet you. Um, in terms of this, how many different uh, places have you really tested this model on the revenue and, um, and the profit piece of it? Um, and what did you do with the so original? So we've tested it. And with the original fundraise, um, what did you do with that money? Okay, so um, we started, we are already uh, working in, in two districts of Pakistan. 
And we tested this model with two partners in Somalia and Nepal, where we found that there is a demand for this product, where we um, actually use this model for solar home systems. Um, with the initial grant, which we got from the Spring Accelerator, because it was such a new innovative model, we used it to, uh, to prototype. So when we were and to them, we had only worked in one village. After that, we were able to expand to about 20 other villages with this model. Um, and, uh, and since then, we have launched the electronic marketplace in partnership with, uh, with WHH, which has uh, grown uh, quite well, specifically in the last couple of months because of the lockdown, where farmers aren't able to sell um, through the normal marketplace. So they're using our um, our facility. Hi, thanks for the presentation. It was good. I just want to ask, you said you're going to move your operations to Netherlands. Is that correct? Well, not the operations, but just our banking and our headquarters. So headquarters. Because, and there's actually two reasons for that. Yeah. Um, the primary reason being um, we want to access uh, Africa and secondary reason being that uh, it'll be easier for us uh, to transfer capital back and forth between countries, which we plan to do. Hmm. And you plan to increase the price of the meat from $6 to $10. Uh, that's in line with what the current market is there? Yes. So. Um, my uh, my colleague Lisa is also on the call, and if she wants, she could just jump in. Um, but what I can speak to that is that uh, we are currently slowly climbing the retail pyramid. So currently, we're selling live animals to a meat company, and our next step is partnering with the grocery chains and uh, launching the meat line, which will allow us to get a higher margin. Uh, the ultimate target, of course, is farm to fork. Mm. Okay, I just need to wrap this around my head for a while. So in case somebody has a question, please go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Hi there. I've got one if I may. Uh, can you can you tell us about the uh, logistics and the, uh, the scalability of the logistics? Uh, I, I noticed one of your slides says um, increased volume of animals procured exponentially through app. So uh, how how are you going to service that mm -hmm. with networks of uh, pickup locations, trucks, things like that? Are you you doing that yourself, or are you partnering with uh, with a logistics company? What's the what's the plan there for scalability? So so right now, um, what happens is that our agents use the app uh, to to input information about uh, about the farmers and. We have a sort of a, uh, each collection center is serviced by 10 to 15 agents, which are hired by us and also by independent agents. And they use the app to, to input information about the animals. Um, the reason why we're launching uh, goats for phones, which is goats for smartphones, is because we want um, the farmers to have the app themselves uh, as well. Um, and, and and that once that happens, then then we're not relying on a smaller team, but farmers themselves can start entering the data of the animals. And right now, yes, we do handle the logistics. So what happens is that, that uh, we have collections centers and uh, these service um, about an eight kilometer radius. And, uh, and, and we want to actually bring on board transport companies onto the platform uh, so that the buyers can directly buy from the farmers and the logistics guys can just uh, transfer the animals in the middle. Bert, how do you make sure that the exchange uh, um, uh, determination is correct? Yes, that is actually my favorite question. Uh, so I actually used to work in the power sector where I used to price electricity and uh, so the way we do that is the app um, takes in certain key characteristics of the animal, uh, including the gender, the weight, the teeth, the breed. 
um, et cetera. And we have, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. And we have an algorithm which actually calculates the exact, uh, exact value of, of each animal based on the going market rate. And what we eventually want to do, and this is where we want to move towards, is have an, uh, have have machine learning incorporated so that so that fewer and fewer um, x variables are needed to be able to predict the value so things like once we know that this particular geographic area is yielding this kind of a value for animal then the app automatically knows which 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 regions are giving what quality of animals and this also actually allows us to monitor what are the input needs for for different areas um, that we're working in and Faril, um, i mean you're, you're growing on to many many countries as well how do you make sure that you have the local knowledge because in your team um, you, you have certain knowledge, but they're all di in different places. Yes, so that's where we actually... One that... Go on. Sorry, yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, so yes, so, so that is where we rely on our partners. So for example, in, um, in Uganda, uh, we are looking at a company which is a solar company and they understand their customers and they want to be able to expand their customer base. They're actually working on microgrids and one of their biggest issues is affordability. So together with them, we looked into a project finance model where, where the community's equity is paid in livestock and then, and then that kind of, the rest of it is paid either through uh, the company's funds or it is collected over time. Um, so the partners bring us the local knowledge and the key knowledge here is actually an understanding of the value chain um, of the livestock uh, and of the meat industry in the country. Um, and the advantage that we are bringing is that we are looking at a partnership with a halal food company based in the UK um, and they are constantly in search for traceable animals and that opens up like a global market for, for us. Right now we are, we are doing domestic, but we want to be able to aggregate all these animals into one sales point or to one buyer. So Pariel, in your model, who will do the processing of live animals from farm to fork model? Currently, we're doing it. Well, we're doing a part of it. So, for example, we are right now delivering live animals right from the farmer down to the meat company that is buying uh, buying the animals. Um, and what we want to be able to do is actually be able to trace that animal because we are uniquely placed where we can track that animal where it was born um, down to the plate. So, so this. Uh, right now, we're doing it till the till the abattoir, and then the abattoir traces uh, the uh, traces the meat then onwards. Mm. Okay, my my comment on on your model is this: I still cannot understand the need to move your headquarters to Netherlands. I think there's an element of cost there for me. Second thing is, I would actually just start Pakistan first, right? If you have a base in Pakistan and you can scale this model to 10 locations in Pakistan. I think you have a winner there. But trying to stretch the monies to go to Uganda and Rwanda, I think stretches your dollar thinly. And you know, even if you want to get to the three locations in, in Pakistan, that's already an achievement. But I think trying to go to three countries at one time, I, I think is thinning your, your capital uh, that you are going to raise. Absolutely, I, I think I agree, agree with you. We are looking at the timeline, right? So our focus is definitely Pakistan, but our ambition definitely is also global because the reason why we're doing what we're doing is to be able to impact as many people with this model as we can. Um, and I agree that um, scaling it up in country is, is the best short and medium term goal, which we are focused on. Um, but we are looking at 
taking this model to be able to help farmers um, in other countries as well. So, so it will uh, help us scale it up faster. Sorry, sorry, Raj, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, Parul, you, you, you mentioned the word focus, right? So when you say focus, it's a very important word to use. And as an investor, we True, take the word very seriously. And really, with the capital you're raising, I don't think you can reach three countries, right? So mm -hmm. become king of one first and then move on to the others. Sorry, Greg. Uh, yeah, no, agree, actually, agree. perfect perfect segue into my question, which is, um, are, are you... Are you building an IT company? Is that where the expertise is? Is there a need? Uh, is there a need to bring the IT in house, or should you be focused on other areas of expertise? Well, um, actually, that is the area of expertise in the sense that uh, we are currently what is holding us up is we've got one iteration of the app, which I can run you through. And now we need to bring in changes. We're based in Pakistan where, where, where there is a lot of um, tech talent. Um, and it gives us a lot more sort of uh, maneuverability with our, with our app. Right now we have, a, we have a tech partner and they've developed the app uh, to this point. Um, but we need to make quick changes as we are adapting to the market. Uh, and we want to be able to do it faster rather than paying huge sums of money externally and waiting for our turn to, to, you know, to have those changes done. Well, I, I have a, um, a problem with um, the model itself. You started off by saying uh, that you were trying to take out the middleman by getting the farmers to work directly. Um, if you go on to your electronic marketplace model um, mm -hmm. and wouldn't you be that middleman anyway, that's uh, trading in the middle and taking a margin as well? Yeah, I had the same question, Nathan, thank you. Uh, that's a question that we get a lot. And, and I think um, what needs to be understood right now, the way the market works, it's not just one middleman at this point. When the farmer sells, he sells to a local middleman. Um, then that middleman takes it to a local uh, marketplace where there are bigger middlemen or city middlemen who are there who then take it to the city marketplace. And then the meat company is there, right? Which is processing. So there's four layers there. And between farm to fork, there are at least seven. So yes, we will be we will be becoming a middleman, but we'll be one more efficient middleman, rather than a so, layer of a chain of seven or eight. So in in these types of disintermediation efforts, um, depending on the market and more so in developing countries, there may be entrenched interests that actually prevent the full efficiencies of your model from being realized. Could you uh, could you speak to that, please? Um, yes, I could. Um, so we are, we live in a, I mean, I live in a country and Pakistan is, and certainly the area that we work in are, there's, um, there's a lot of inequality and inequality in land holding. Um, and this is, this is where feudalism literally comes from. And feudals are basically people who have held land for generations and they are, and they become political leaders and spiritual leaders and they themselves are involved in this business. So yes, there are vested interests, um, but we have not faced any opposition to this. Uh, and I think, you know, when, uh, when COVID hit and uh, the shutdown was announced, I was literally sitting back and thinking, okay, now we need to figure out what we're going to do next. And within three weeks, our numbers just started jumping. Um, we were doing 70 animals a week. And now we are doing, uh, sorry, we were doing 70 to 80 animals a month. And now we're doing 200. Uh, and so we see that there is a demand. There is a future there, regardless of the entrenched interest. Uh, there, is, there is growth there. And... Um, those are the ones that I can speak to and I have witnessed. How, how do the farmers react when they're dealing with female, under, female entrepreneur? 
Okay, the farmers are great. I have never faced, I've never felt uncomfortable. I've never felt that unsafe or I've never felt like, oh, you know, uh, this, I, I, that, that I can't do this or I'm not getting through to them. They're very receptive. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we have a predominantly women run team. And I think, and, and we realized we have to hire a man to do our sales because one of, one of the buyers who we are, who we're trying to deal with, they basically told us that, oh, we can't, uh, we don't actually deal with the women. So as soon as the, as our key account manager came on board, so he's now dealing with them, which is great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not the farmers that, that we face any kind of uh, sex sexism. Yeah, that, that, that was a concern for me because, you know, being a Muslim uh, country, uh, you'll have some challenges there, but it's good that you are overcoming that. Fariel, on your ask, are you looking for a loan? Or are you looking for an equity investment? I'm looking for a loan because we'll be able to start repaying pretty soon. These numbers are pretty, pretty realistic. Uh, these aren't, uh, these aren't, and that's why I've kept the projections short term. They're not going way into the future. Uh, these are really very realistic numbers. We are selling at 6.3. We are doing 200 um, animals at this point. We're in talks with, with grocery chains to be able to sell at about 7.8. We are already, I've already interviewed uh, um, the manager for our second location, NRSP, which is the largest microfinance bank, has reached out to us because because of the shutdown, uh, their their um, livestock portfolio uh, is is under threat because the farmers aren't able to sell their animals and therefore not able to repay the loans. So they have reached out to us to start with them as soon as possible. So we are looking at a pretty strong trajectory and growth phase um, and we've and we've got the capital to be able to grow a bit but we do need we do need uh, at least 150,000 to grow to three locations. Thank you very much Fariel. I'd like to just switch the conversation now to the angels and uh, interest in in the ask. Thoughts Greg? Nathan? I'd be open to discussing alone. Great. Fabulous, Greg. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll be okay for a loan. Um, I, I, I like the model. Um, I just need uh, Farrell to focus on one country and ex execute that. So um, I would prefer to look at an equity rather than a loan. Hmm. I'm just excited to see women entrepreneurs. We can discuss that. Can you say that again, Harash? I, I missed you. There. I'm just excited to see women entrepreneurs going out there, and especially in a what I would call a difficult country like uh, Pakistan, where it's very uh, what's the right word for this? And I must put it politically correct. <laughs> um, it's a male-dominated uh, country, so uh, I wish you good luck. Uh, but, but I think we need to chat on the side, and maybe with Nathan and Greg, we'll come back to you on this. Yeah, and I would personally love to continue the discussion as well, Fabio. I just just to learn more about your model. I think it's a it's a, it's a very innovative model, and um, I think disintermediation, especially with data and technology, is is, is always interesting. I like to see connecting informal markets to the, the the global markets through technology, and I think you're doing exactly that. So I'd love to participate in the discussion with Haresh, Greg, and Nathan, and uh, see where we go. Thank you very much. And uh, there's a poll up now on um, uh, whether you'd invest in Uptrade. So uh, let's see what you think. Thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you. Good luck. Just, just, just before before you, you leave, could you talk a tiny bit about the, the, the terms of the loan in the sense of if you were to take a loan, how long would you need it for and what would you use it for? Sorry, if I were to take a loan? How long would you need it for? What would be the term of the loan? And um, what would you use it for? I mean, ideally we'd like it. Yeah. Um, 
ideally uh, we would like it for as long as our lender is comfortable lending us for um, but it would take about I would say two to three years uh, depending on the size of the loan um, and we would use it for our definitely for our marketing for our expansion uh, to three to four locations whatever the sum of amount that we have um, and like I said uh, getting an in-house resource uh, for our app um, and these would be the three primary things that we would focus on and, and, and if you are interested I could take you through a quick run through of our app so this is our app this is where we're at um, so here we go. So this is our agent who is logging in with uh, the password and now they are registering the farmer and they take key information like their incomes, they take the picture and now they register all the animals that they currently own. And once that registration is done, then they look into the animal that is being sold key characteristics like weight, like body score, ages done through teeth, the breed of the animal, and then the pricing. Um, and a tag code is issued. And this is, this, is where, this is where this demo ends. But this basically what we're working on now is to be able to throw up a price for the agents and the farmers uh, using the market price. So this is our app right now great well thank you very much that, that looks impressive and uh, um, easy to use and um, I know that's hard to 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 uh, design so thanks for, for that demo thank you to everybody who joined us thank you to Fariel Diana Mover Rock for a great uh, presentation thank you Jan Lemuel and and everybody at Living Labs Foundation for finding these two great companies and I just want to say for all those other entrepreneurs who are on the call and who know entrepreneurs, please spread the word, apply to pitch on the nest through our website, findthenest.org. And I do hope to see you all next week. Next week we'll be at our usual time at 9 a.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. London and 7 p.m. Nairobi time. Thank you very much all. And I hope you have a good time. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.